The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. going to do something different this morning. Now, you know me, I'll be preaching intermittently, <laughs> whether I'm trying to or not, but uh, we wanted to have some intercession. We're, uh, our country's at a crucial time, historically. I even saw a, a joke where, how many saw that movie, Back to the Future? I can remember the old guy telling the young guy, don't go to 2020. <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, but yet at the same time, God's been speaking advancement. And so what I really want us to do is to recognize uh, as an individual believer, no matter what your vocation is, no matter where you're placed in this life, there was four principles that God's been speaking very clearly. One, know your jurisdiction. Whether you're a student, whether it's an, you're an employee somewhere, you're an employer, a neighborhood, church, all of those are places where God has appointed the exact time and the exact place in which you should live. But in that jurisdiction, it comes a responsibility. And you have all been gifted. And what's interesting is it says that by grace you've been saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone boast. Yet at the same time, we are his workmanship, Ephesians 2.10, created in Messiah Jesus for good works, which were prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. If ever there was a time to find out and enter into your purpose, your divine purpose, uh, when purpose is not known, abuse is inevitable. That's the unfortunate part, because people will do something. I used to have people used to tell me, I'm getting there, and I'm going, where's there? And they didn't really know. They're just working at it. But where purpose is not known, abuse is inevitable. And I believe that we're at a crucial time right now that our mindset has to be a Christian mindset. You can't just say, I'm a Christian. Uh, what did I call it yes, the other day? Chinos. And they, Jennifer said, what's a Chino? I said, Christian in name only. Christianity is about being an expression of having a real relationship with God, not just a little name tag like, you know, Standing in a garage doesn't make you a car. Uh, standing in a church doesn't make you a Christian. And I believe that what God is speaking right now is about gifts. And that each one of you, uh, before the foundation of the earth, He saw your substance, even though it was yet unformed, in your book, yes. God's book. Yes. They were all written, the days fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. Yes. And I think that's a, a beautiful expression of recognizing that Psalm 139 says, Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed, and in your book all the days were written. And something uh, that, you know, people, this is a, a, a crucial election at this point in time. Uh, it seems like um, uh, the older you get, the more you've seen a process. The younger people have not seen some of the process that we've seen. We get too soon old, too, too late smart sometimes, but uh, I am now mature and wise. You know how I got there? It was because when I was young and stupid, God protected me. All right? <laughs> so we're praying protection for all the young and stupid people. <laughs> all right? Because we all were on that edge a little bit. But... Um, I want to share something uh, that basically Sid Roth brought to our attention some time ago, that how to vote as a Christian. Because I'm hearing uh, all kinds of strange stuff. I'm hearing um, little, little talking points that aren't even logical, but people repeat a talking point, and when they don't know the answer, they just repeat something that they heard on the news or what have you, or worse, Facebook. Because you know if it's on Facebook, it's got to be true, right? Okay. But uh, you should be voting as a believer, as a Christian, with a Christian worldview. 
And I've heard all the excuses, so I'm not going to get into that because we're going to have a time of intercession today instead of a sermon except what I sneak in. All right. But God has always had three main areas that trigger judgment on a nation. So I think if you're going to vote, I'd like to know what those three triggers are. And the first one, and this goes all the way back, child sacrifice. To appease false gods. The old false god was called Baal, and the new false god is called pleasure and convenience. How many have ever heard of the god of convenience? That's when you change your Christianity's foundation to what might be culturally relevant or acceptable or easier. You know, there's a broad way that leads to destruction. It might be easier. But it's still broad and leads to destruction. The end is the same. And ever since Roe versus Wade, 60 million babies have been murdered by the abortion in the U.S. And Scripture says that my eyes saw your substance yet unformed, and they were all written. And these days were fashioned for me when yet there was none of them. And Psalm 127.3 says, Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. There needs to be understood basic Christianity. This is Christianity 101. There's a difference between ownership and stewardship. You don't own your children. They're an inheritance from the Lord. The stewardship, yes, responsibility to bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord, but ultimately... They're God's servants, not yours. They belong to Him and not to you. Living Bible 14.4. They're God's servants, not yours. They belong. Mothers need this sometimes because they get a little clingy. huh? When the kid starts to get on their own, when they're still a little bit stupid, but they're on their own. <laughs> they're God's servants, not yours. They belong to Him and not to you. And God is able to tell them whether they're right or wrong, and God is able to make them do as they should. But all the way back to, and we've written the book on the Didache, the instruction that the early Christian uh, Jewish apostles, yes, Jewish apostles, yeah, yeah. what they basically taught Gentiles who were clueless, who had no cultural bearing. Matter of fact, if they didn't want a girl, they just left her out in the cold because they wanted a boy. And suddenly these Gentiles become followers of Messiah Jesus. And these Jewish people had to find out there's no Gospels yet, only Old Testament. How do we tell these people? And you know what they did? They basically broke down what we would know as the Ten Commandments and what Jewish people knew as it. They broke it down into little minute little fragments so these Gentiles would know the difference between right and wrong regardless of what they were accustomed to, regardless of the majority in their culture. And I mean a majority in their culture. And they were taught, first and foremost, the two big sins that had to be broken down into baby language almost, was murder, of which Jesus taught the apostles, elevated murder to even speaking against someone. Three categories, even in the Old Testament, three categories. You speak against somebody... You sin. You might even be taken to court, second level. Third, third level is God's going to judge you. Well, Jesus elevated that to where God's in charge of all three. Murder is with your tongue and with your lips. Murder then had a way of saying, oh, people say, but I haven't murdered anybody. But even in the early church, they had in the teaching of the apostles, in the Didache, before we had Gospels, they taught them to build a fence, which was very Jewish. A fence means, oh, you may not murder anybody, you may not have committed adultery, but if you don't build a fence and deal with murder when it's anger, if you don't deal with adultery when it's lustful thoughts, if you don't use that as a fence to guard your heart, you will eventually, because it builds. It builds authority. 
But here's basically, for a Christian, here's how, you, how a Christian should vote now, not a Christian in name only, not just because you had a name tag, not just because you went to church, but a Christian worldview. Because Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He hasn't changed. The world has changed, remarkably so, that culture has infiltrated even the church for the sake of the God of convenience. But the three points that brought judgment on a nation was child sacrifice. The second was any destruction in the concept of marriage. And we're in the process now where culturally they're redefining marriage. Churches have to maintain holy matrimony to make a distinction. And thirdly, coming against the Jew or Israel. That's historic. I will bless those that bless you, and I will curse those who curse you. You and in all of your families of the earth shall be blessed. So this is a, a, a worldwide uh, event. And God promised us not just the salvation of souls, but He's promised us the nations as an inheritance. And the day's going to come when they're going to be judged as whether they're sheep or goat nations. And I, for one, am praying that this nation is going to be a sheep nation. And those three criteria... Now, I've heard the arguments, even from Christians, on uh, abortion. And it, to me, it's, it's very weak and thims, flimsy, but you know how things get spread to where everybody uses the same catchphrase? Right now, they're using the catchphrase. There's other issues just as important. I want you to name one. Because murder in the Old Testament was murder has to do with innocence. It's not kill. It's not thou shalt not kill. It's thou shalt not murder innocently. So I want to have a time of intercessory prayer because I believe there are Christians that are sincere. You know, you can be sincerely wrong. We pray with people over and over again just to teach them how to forgive from the heart when they were sincerely wrong <laughs> and doing it from their head. It's hard to get through sincerity. And you're not going to be able to do it with an argument. Have you ever tried to argue with someone? Because, you see, it's actually it's spiritual. And some say, well, keep politics out of Christianity. You can't because it's spiritual. There's no, there's no divide. Spiritual and political is all one and the same because it's coming from your heart. Devotion. So bless Israel, bless the Lord, all my soul, and we are, I'm going to vote basically for that which supports Israel. I'm going to vote for that which on their platform has pro life. Mm -hmm. And my knowledge of Scripture says that the excuse that that's my body, no, that's God's child. That is, not yours. They belong to him and not to you. Those are all weak arguments. And oh, oh, the one I like though is even Christians are trying to say, but there's other issues besides abortion. You're going to stand before the Lord because you know what? When God is about to do, I believe, a beautiful thing for the church of Jesus, not Christian in name only, but for the church of Jesus, because in Moses' day, they were in bondage, and they were killing the babies, and God sent deliverance. Uh, in that case, he used Moses, but they were killing the babies. In Jesus' day, they were killing the babies, and in our day, they're killing the babies. I think it's about time that we stood up and took a stand and recognized where do you stand on these issues, and this uh, cute little one-liners that you can hear on mainline well, Facebook, <laughs> uh, they really don't hold any weight. The real question is, I believe we need to pray for people who have been deceived, just like Eve was deceived. Anybody can fall into deception. They were deceived just like Eve, but they've, they've moved from the simplicity that's in Jesus. He hasn't changed, nor his value system has never changed. We've got documentation of 
the value system, not only from the Old Testament, but before there was even a New Testament. And the New Testament, what did Jesus do? He elevated it and made it harder. I like that part because it requires empowerment. It requires grace. Grace by definition. Everybody in Kingdom Life Church and those watching regularly by uh, YouTube and Facebook, this is the definition you need. Grace is the personal presence of Jesus empowering you. Got to use that word because everybody's like into free stuff now. The free gift. Yeah, it's a free gift, but it's the empowerment. It's the personal presence of Jesus empowering you or enabling you to be and to do all that he called you to be and all that he called you to do. And I'll tell you what, I believe there's a mandate going out for real Christianity to rise up because God planned your life before the foundation of the earth. He planned works for you to walk in, to expand the kingdom of God. And that doesn't mean you have to all be preachers. What it means is expand the kingdom of God because he gave you a jurisdiction. He's given you authority or anointing in that jurisdiction if you use it under the lordship of Jesus. And what takes place is you advance the kingdom of God through displacement. Displacement is genuine spiritual warfare. And what I want to pray for is there's a lot of quality believers who have gone off into deception with listening more to uh, CNN than, the, than to the Bible. And unfortunately, I believe that you cannot win them with an argument. It's going to take prayer and it's going to take pushing away the powers of darkness from around their minds so that they can make a free will decision. I remember Jennifer praying for her brother who was off on some crazy theology and she just got, did a lot of rug time where she just wept and prayed for her brother. And, you know, eventually, all of a sudden, it was like, why don't we get a more balanced uh, and actually went to the higher ups. This was an Episcopalian uh, church to the higher ups to say, let's have a little better program here. This is kind of humanistic theology here. And he changed and brought about a and facilitated a quality change for a lot of people's lives. There's times when we've prayed to push back the power. You cannot, it's witchcraft to control somebody's will. This has nothing to do with changing somebody's will. This has to do with pushing back the powers of darkness that they can make a free will decision for themselves. Young people, you're going to have it tougher because there's going to be, you're going to have to deal with majority. People my age have seen uh, what socialism and communism has done historically. But young people, you've been taught that it's a good thing. You get free stuff. You know, so what we're going to do is you can't convince you with an argument because most of your peers will say, talk the same way. What we have to do is basically pray for you and bless them that curse, pray for them that despitefully you, do good to them that hate because God's way will win in the long run. God's way is love and it never changes. His will is for oneness. His way is always love and His word is reality. And it doesn't change. Anybody you want to hear that has a new revelation or something that's relevant is probably pulling something from the culture, not the word of God. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever and He hasn't changed. So, the three qualifications that... Uh, Others have said, and I agree, is what's their stand on abortion? Two, what do they say about marriage? Because historically, communism, which starts with socialism, that's where the camel gets the nose in, because it looks appealing at first. But it's all of them will say, Karl Marx will say, Socialism is a stepping stone, but we, we do it like the frog in the water. We do it so gradual. Right now, they're pulling you in with green. To make you a communist, in the long run, they start with something that sounds pretty good. The environment. That's important, isn't it? The earth is the Lord's the fullness thereof. I care about the environment. But I also know when someone's manipulating me, and redefining marriage, and coming against the Jew. 
I don't know if as far as I'm concerned as an American, I'm pro-Israel as a believer. But as far as your gifting that you had in you before you were formed in your mother's womb, think about that, before you were formed in your mother's womb. One time God spoke to me in prayer and he just said, I want you to see how beautiful you were in my eyes before you were formed in your mother's womb. I'm going, wow, that was before I had a chance to be Dennis the Menace and mess up. I was probably pretty good then. Yeah. In other words, God saw me through Jesus fused together as a new creation and Dennis the Menace hadn't even been born yet. Wow. I wonder what my maximum potential could have been. But when it comes to that calling, there's three things you can do. And this is something I want you to take to heart before we open it up for intercession. First of all, are you going to make a commitment to build or advance the kingdom of God in your jurisdiction? Even that job that you can't stand. Will you bring unapologetically the love of Jesus into that arena? Your jurisdiction. Secondly, the gifts that God's placed in you. This is an important one because this is, a, this, is a, this is a subtle rebellion. The very gifts that God gave you that he put in you before you were formed in your mother's womb that sure, perhaps you developed them later in life. But did you use those gifts for yourself or for the advancement of the kingdom? Come on, businessman, I'm talking. This applies to everyone, regardless of vocation. Did you use your gifts to advance you or to advance the cause of the kingdom of God? And thirdly, and this is unfortunately often the case, or did you basically take your gifts and for one reason or another, fear usually, you just neglected them altogether, never developed them? never attempted to. Matthew twenty two fourteen 14 says, Many are called, but few are chosen. You've all heard that. Another translation says, Many are called, but few are commissioned. It requires integrity. It requires responsibility. It requires you to be faithful in little so that you can be commissioned to be faithful in much. So that's, that's the challenge that I see it. I fear lest somehow the serpent has deceived, just as Eve, by his craftiness, so that your minds might be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Messiah. If minds are blinded, that's when I felt like God says, read this to the congregation and commission them to do likewise, because you all have different vocations, you all have different jurisdictions, you're all in different walks of life, single, married, what have you. Um, but in Acts 26, when Paul was giving his testimony, remember, what was Paul doing? Mindset-wise. Pulling Christians out <laughs> and getting rid of them. That's pretty evil. But it says... In his explanation, while I was thus occupied, <laughs> in other words, I was using my gifts and talents in religion to get Christians. While I was thus occupied, I journeyed to Damascus with authority and commission from all the chief priests. At midday, O king, along the road I saw a light from heaven shining brighter than the sun, shining around me and those who journeyed with me. And when we had all fallen to the ground, that's, that's a Damascus Road experience. We want to demask us experience, don't we? And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice speaking to me saying in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It's hard to kick against the ghost. So I said, who are you, Lord? <laughs> good, good revelation right off the bat. I can still remember when I was a young drug addict and, and uh, my friends were telling me to join the ACLU and all of these organizations and, oh, yeah, yeah, as long as everybody else was doing it. I didn't know what it was, but hey, yeah, yeah. And then all of a sudden I got saved. There was like instant clarity on my value system. 
I don't know why that doesn't happen to everybody, but the Christian worldview was pretty much established. Right and wrong was made a little clear. I, I didn't have a word to explain what happened at my conversion experience, but like him, a light shined on my heart through the face of Jesus, and you know what? I had clarity. That was my word, clarity, clarity. This is the way people were meant to live. <laughs> why doesn't everybody live like this? Well, I could have said, Dennis, why weren't you living like that? But the purpose, and this is the challenge even for today. And he says, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, but rise and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness, both of the things which you have seen and of the things which I will yet reveal to you. I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles to whom I now send you to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God that they might receive forgiveness of sin and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by me. To turning from power of darkness to light. That's our commission. So when we pray, you can't win an argument with someone who's in a mental stronghold. And by the way, it's a religion. Atheist is a religion. And it's, it's a spiritual warfare. They... There's people that are willing to die for what they believe in. That's a religion. Somehow you've got a stronghold if it's other than Jesus. It's a powerful stronghold, isn't it? So we're going to pray this morning. I want to pray because I've got relatives, I've got friends. That quite frankly, I think they've gone off the deep end. And you, you, you won't win them with an argument. You just won't. You can be all as confident that you're the greatest debater in the whole world. You're not going to win an argument with a stronghold. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Strongholds are mental strongholds. Pulling down mental strongholds, casting down imaginations and proud, arrogant thoughts that exalts themselves against the knowledge of God. Well, then how are we going to do it? You're going to have to pray because you're not going to win that argument. Even some of you have struggled in your own minds with arguments. But it's a losing battle because you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna lose. The carnal mind is at enmity with God. It's better to give that mind and say, I need the mind of God in this. And there are friends of mine, people that we love, that need the mind of God because my arguments won't work. Are we going to pray like that today? All right. Jennifer, come on up. We're going to start praying. If you want to get up, well, Jennifer will give you instructions. She loves intercession, so look out. She's my tiger, and she roars. The daughter, well, she's actually a lion. The daughter of a lion is a lion. Right? Right. I want to say one thing before we start, um, that we are really in a, a, an era there's an economic war. There were there have been four great epochs in history. The first was in the time of like Alexander the Great, when armies were capturing land, and then there was um, there were um, at the time of the founding of this nation, we were in an era of political struggle. What form of government? And we know that God's form of government, Jesus, uh, came to set the captives free, bring liberty to the oppressed. Um, God's form of government was established in America, and America was founded on a couple of covenants made with God himself. So we have the unique, um, along with Israel, America was birthed out of a covenant with God. And, but right now we're in an economic war which is going to win, socialism, communism, or free enterprise. And I just want to say this. I, I actually am planning a message on this a little bit later, but I've been so immersed in studying and writing that I didn't do it. Do you know in the early years of this nation when we were colonies that the preachers would preach election sermons? Yes and explain the issues. Now, I want to tell you where capitalism came from. Capitalism came straight out of the Bible. Um, when 
the pilgrims came over to Plymouth and they were told by the trading company that financed them, okay, you have to live in Christian communism. They had all things in common. The women did, banded together and did it, the chores for everybody, not just those of their household, but um, they almost starved because they worked common land and they didn't have an invest personal investment. They weren't emotionally connected to it. And so William Bradford went to the Bible and brought out the principles of biblical economics. You know how God gave land to the different people and the different tribes and all that. He gave each family their land and and you are responsible for your own land and what you grow and if you have extra you can trade with other people and prosper. Well, and tell them their uh, socialists are using they had all things in common. Right. What does that right. mean? Well, so you can trace it back, capitalism, to the Bible, to Israel's God's economics. Don't use faulty weights and cheat people if you're in business. And then in the Middle Ages, the Christian monasteries, the monks took a vow of poverty, but the monasteries themselves became richer than some kings because of their land holdings, and they um, ran businesses, vineyards, um, agriculture. They even developed a rudimentary banking system for the people. And, and then it was brought over here in America with the founding fathers who turned to a wonderful Christian man in the first book of biblical of the first book of capitalistic economics it was written and this was published the same year the Declaration of Independence was signed so capitalism came from God socialism is actually a counterfeit of Christian unity we know that when that the early believers, the first century believers were in unity and they would come to meetings and each one out of their spirit would come a psalm, a hymn, a spiritual song. So there was individuality, but they were one spirit. They could be who God created them to be. Socialism came straight from the pit of hell. And it had been talked about many, many years and people had tried it. They tried it in Plymouth, Plymouth at Plymouth, Christian communism, which didn't work. And then in modern days, along comes Karl Marx and Frederick Engels. Karl Marx was a Satanist. He never worked a day in his life. He sponged off his parents and Engels himself. And he, you should, he has a play that he wrote and poetry to Satan. And so I was reading a book on him in my studies, and it got so horrible, I couldn't even finish it. He never bathed. It said he was never known to take a bath. His family grew up in abject poverty, all atheists who hated God. Do you know who picked up on Marx's writings first? Hitler. And from Hitler, it went to Russia, and Lenin and Stalin, and they implemented, and their idea was we're going to force people into this. Now, what socialism is, in its pure form, is the government controls everything. You read about North Korea and what happened to those people. That is the purest form of socialism in the world. And the people had no right to think for themselves. They were scared to think because if you thought something against the government and it came out of your mouth, you'd be dead or sent off to one of their horrible concentration camps. And if you want to have nightmares, read about those concentration camps in North Korea. How, that would start out mildly as political correctness. Right, you? right. We're seeing it today. You can't say certain things. We're losing our First Amendment rights to free speech. Because see what, what capitalism does, it exalts the human spirit, this creator spirit that's in us, that was deposited in us by our Father God. But in socialism, it's supposed to be complete conformity they divided the people into three castes based on how how they were how good a communist they were judged to be they were your um, they were your outcasts at the bottom and then on another level there were the ones who were wavering one was hostile wavering and then core which would be your good communists 
They had no right to where they would live or what they would do. They were assigned everything about their lives from, that's what central planning means. If you've heard that phrase, that means the government controls everything. And then they were told where to work. Nobody was paid based on what they did, actually. They just got, um, a, talk about equality. Okay, everybody works at the factory. Who works at the factory from the manager of the factory down to the one who sweeps the floor is going to get the same. So it didn't matter if you did a good job. There was no way to improve your lot in life. So that's the devil's unity. Everybody forced to conform. You read the story of, you can look her up, Leonmi Park, and it's um, she got a book where she, her journey out of the slavery of North Korea, and it is slavery. And she started reading once she got out, and she wanted to study and learn. She had kind of a rudimentary education where she could read and write. But she said as she wrote and her vocabulary improved, she began to think. And it's just amazing. She's actually an activist now with a, with a voice um, for freedom in the we world. We were going to do these teachings in a small studio, but I think Jennifer needs to cover it for the church. Oh, I am going to cover it so here. So we'll do it both. Right. But you can see right there, the for the socialists and communists, it's everybody the same. This is truly equality. Everybody paid the same. So tell us about that scripture that I hear over and over oh, again from oh, They that, had all that, things in common. It says so in the Bible, Acts chapter 2. Right. In Acts, it says the, that the believers had all things in common, and they went to their houses daily praising God. So they still had their houses, right? House they still had property. They gave what they had. They laid it at the feet of the apostles, not the government. Big difference. Big difference. And not only that, but I, I kind of wish they would have kept it. But when they did the Declaration of Independence, they said... Uh, Life, liberty, liberty and, and the pursuit, pursuit of, of happiness. happiness. That was originally changed at the last minute. It was originally changed the right to property. Life, liberty, and the right to property. Because what socialism wants to do is own it. It takes people's property. Eventually. Hugo Chavez... Once, when he got in in Venezuela, he started out, nobody quite knew that he was a communist, and so that was the frog in the boiling water that warmed up slowly, and people suddenly began to realize who he was. But he would go through the countryside, and he would somebody, see somebody's nice uh, farm and lands and all that, and he'd say, I want that. And their property was gone, because they no longer had property rights. So... This is this is really serious, and I hope you young people will learn the truth about communism and socialism and capitalism. Let me give my scriptural. It's not baby just getting lesson. free stuff. It's, it's not about free stuff. Well, that's how it would work. It wouldn't work without uh, 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 a, bait. A, a bait. A bait. It has to be bait. But here's the part that interested me, and. In, uh, Jennifer will probably go into detail more about Adam Smith on the Wealth of Nations, a, a book that was used by our founders. He was the father of modern economics, and, and he was a godly man, and he drew from the Bible. But here's, here's the way you could look at it in super simple English. There's two kingdoms. There's God, and there's the devil. It's, it's not complicated. The devil robs, kills, and destroys. And you should find within anything that's not pure, robbing, killing, or destroying. Even if it's just, even if it's just motivation. You kill somebody's motivation, they're afraid to think in North Korea for fear. Afraid of their own thoughts that if all of it said to come out of my mouth, someone would turn me in. And, oh, they do turn you in. We had somebody in our neighborhood, a little kid ran down the street to play with their friend and they got turned in because they didn't wear a mask. That's in the neighborhood, two neighborhood kids. So don't think for a minute, you don't have people that will turn you in. But here's the thing, rob, kill, destroy. But then this was, this was Adam Smith in the simplest form. The love commandment. What is the love commandment? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and one another as yourself, the first thing that you learned was there is a self-love to where you respect 
yourself. And you love another, you see, and the example that, that really struck me was the person who was arthritic and couldn't button their buttons. And you, as an individual, invest in, I think I can make snaps. An easier way. An for easier way for that person to do it. And then, this is legal because right now there's a, there's a trend like, how come that CEO makes so much money? It's really none of your business, really. How come, how come all the elite communists and socialists are wealthy? <laughs> you know, that's a dumb question. But they needed snaps. I invested, I invested in baking snaps to better my fellow man. I am compensated for that investment. Others, the invisible hand of creativity that flows out of the human spirit, not the mind, out of the human spirit creativity. Others say we can make it cheaper so that even not just the people that are affluent can handle and buy snaps. We can have everybody can buy snaps because competition comes in, healthy competition, so that other people can make it cheaper and better and more efficient and more people are blessed. Like Henry Ford, cars were too expensive um, unless you were a wealthy person, but he made a car and using Adam an Smith's line. principle of assembly line that came straight from Capitalism Adam Smith. says, let's make more pies. Socialism has had one law all through history from the time of before ox carts, and that was there's only so much, so we got to take it through give, conquest ev give everybody from a somebody little, else. Give everybody we a little sliver. We'll give everybody a sliver, but we got to take it from somebody. The creativity of the human spirit can take oil in the ground and make it productive and multiply it and be a blessing to people. So I, I, to me, it's, it's real simple. It's the great commandment, overly simplified, or destruction. Right. Or like Jason said, Jason used the illustration, you can compare it with the ant that builds something, can function corporately and build something, and then you got the termite who only knows destruction. And to take and keep on taking and take until there's nothing left to take. Well, what Dennis said about the second commandment to love others as you love yourself, that's the essence of capitalism. That is that you produce something that's going to take care of yourself and your family, but you look around at the needs of others and see, okay, this town doesn't have a baker. We need bread. I like to bake. I know a lot about cooking, so I'll invest and I'll make bread. So indirectly it sets up a cycle where you're taking care of your own needs but you end up being a blessing to others and to society and when the early colonists came here and tried socialism william bradford said what first well, thing he after did they was almost after everybody half of them starved to death after everybody starved to death and the people with the bad backs had the biggest baskets for free stuff all of a sudden he went to the bible and says you don't work you don't eat now here's the key though, he gave everybody a plot of land. Whatever you raise is yours, then you can barter with it, do what you want. And they flourished, they flourished. That's what the first Thanksgiving was all about, actually, was about sharing the bounty of capitalism. Mm -hmm. Free enterprise versus rob, kill, destroy. Well, anyway, this is a really crucial um, election probably the most crucial of our lifetimes and that we do have a responsibility to vote but we should also know the issues and know what it's about so we can tell others and I think I've given you some nuggets but we're talking in a couple of days so intercession right. is the most right intercession. obvious thing so I don't know if you've seen all the Start prayer meetings that are going around in this country but it's more than I've ever seen, and praise and worship events. So God is clearly moving. At this and time, if you're watching on YouTube or what have you, if you want to get up and walk around and just pray with us, and if you have something to share, you come on up here right. and, and, and You can share. stay in your seat, get no, up and walk no around sermons, and pray in the Spirit. That's for me. 
and the microphone up here is open if you have a prayer you want to share with everybody okay okay, okay so I want you to just stand up and if you can pray in the spirit if you want to sit down and pray you can sit down and pray but I'd like to move I don't know about you folks but Father, right now, Father, we pray for loved ones, we pray for children. We pray for our children's children. And for, for those, you know, it says, I once was young and now I'm old and I've never seen the righteous begging bread nor their seed. That is what I want to pray for my children and my grandchildren. I want to pray that they're never begging, that there's always the provision because of the godliness of being with the Lord. Stina. Lord, I thank you. I thank you, Lord, that your word is yes and amen. I thank you, Lord, that you have made us more than conquerors in you, Lord, and that conquering is the conquering of the King. Lord, this is a day in which you want your kingdom established here on earth as it is in heaven. So, Father, we just yield to you. We ask for an extension of your kingdom, Lord. We ask for an extension of all that you're doing on this earth, Lord. We call for you, Father, to go forth to go forth and push back those powers of darkness. Father God, you've placed us on this earth at this time for a reason. And I believe that there are Deborahs and Esthers, even among this company, in this group here this morning. And Lord, this is your nation. This was started by your hand. This was instituted by you. And it's an extension of the mission of Jesus to set the captives free. Lord, we thank you, God. We thank you, God, that we have an opportunity to get out and vote. We have an opportunity, Lord, to tell other people. We have an opportunity to move and advance in your kingdom in this nation, Lord. We thank you, God, that you have a plan to take this nation back. We thank you, Lord, that we are breaking the cords of principalities and powers that have held this nation back and turned this nation against the truth of the word of God and brought evil into this land Lord we thank you that you're going to pour out your spirit we thank you Lord that you're going to pour out your spirit upon your church Lord that you have a remnant a holy remnant God that are going to rise up in power Lord and make this nation what you intended it to be that you're going to wrest it out of the hands of the enemy we thank you Lord for the people you're raising up even in politics because God you've got key people who are going to be voted into office in this election Lord senators congressmen and others oh God who will replace those who've worked evil and bring righteousness a righteous government into this land lord it's been prophesied that for 10 years now you are going to be the one ruling out of washington <coughs> and lord we thank you and we add our voices to the voices of the others lord that are repenting before you so that you will heal this land lord we thank you that we are privileged to be part of what you are doing at this time lord this is the battle of the ages lord and we thank you oh god we thank you oh god that you're moving and lord we take our places as responsible citizens of the kingdom of god to do our part for we are your workmanship created in jesus for works that you prepared for us to do lord we ask you lord to take us where you want us to go lord we ask you to give us divine appointments lord so that we can work on your behalf and do the righteous deeds that you've called us to do we thank you oh god we thank you oh god for all the voices that are being raised we thank you lord that you're stirring the hearts of believers lord that you will have your church you will have your church a glorious church we want to pray for those local something that i've learned more than every than anything your governor of your state can make one thing but your local people can change it can't they and so father we just pray for local to take more interest in praying for those locally. This is our jurisdiction. If this is where we live, city, community, county, what have you, 
then, Father, we just take personal responsibility now to pray for those in authority, even now in the local areas, and that, uh, that you would bring godly people into, into the decision-making. And we thank you that the local authorities and local... We, I can see... I just believe that more and more Christians are going to get involved politically locally. And, and there's opportunities here uh, that uh, that mountain can be impacted in a great way for the kingdom of God. So, Father, we just pray right now for those interested and push back the powers of deception and darkness from around them. Uh, <coughs> Come Molly, on up when the Lord puts Molly's something on your heart. Okay, Lord, you, you're speaking a railroad track verse which, in which you said, I am the way. And, and our, our pastors here have given us a lot to consider. We have been well taught here. We can't say we haven't heard, can we? No, and I'm just thanking you, Lord, that here in this house, we want your way. We want you, because you are the truth and you are the life. And as far as voting locally and praying for those, there are many local assembly men and women, and there's only one party representative. You didn't even get a choice in a lot of places. There's been apathy. And Lord, we, we thank you that your way stirs up. It stirs the pot. And we will, if, we will have courage to do that if it's necessary. Amen. Jean. Anyone else? Just slip up your hand. You got a bird. Something that's. You come up. Come on up. Stand up here, Tom. Jean, ladies first here. And then the most handsome man in the church next. <laughs> Father, we thank you that you sent light into darkness. You came down. And we thank you for your son. And we thank you for that light that does pierce the darkness. And we ask you, Father, that you give us all unction, a voice to speak forth your words of life, Lord, to pierce the darkness, to pierce the darkness. And that we would avail ourselves of allowing your rivers of living water to flow from us, even when words can't be spoken. We can emanate your spirit and your, and your life, your son, to many others. We thank you, Holy Spirit. And we thank you for the fact that, Father, you were the voice that brought light into darkness, into chaos, and that you use your people to do the same. And we ask that you do that in us and through us. In Jesus' name. Tom, you got to stand over here more, though. We're off camera a little bit. Right. That's good. Unto us a child is born, a son is given, the government shall be upon his shoulder. His name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the, gov of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end upon the throne of David. So Lord God, as you reminded Israel to look to their founders, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, I ask you to rem remember the founders of this nation that look to you to create this country, Lord God. And may, your, may it be your government, may it forever increase in the United States of America. In his name, amen. Amen. Anybody else, just come up here. It'll be a blessing for you to share the prayer that's on your heart. Okay, stand in the middle, though, because the camera... There we go. Father, today we rejoice in you. You are God, the Almighty. And Lord, this is your country, this is your people, and we stand rejoicing today, even as the Israelites coming out of the desert, standing before a river that was flowing that looked tremendous. How do we get across? How do we get across Tuesday, Lord, into break out into your new kingdom that you're raising this country to be. But we know you are God. 
And as we, by faith, take a step as the priest took a step and stepped into the water, you, God, came down and you parted the river. You parted the river and you will part the river this Tuesday as we wait for you to pour back the water, send it north to Adam and send the other to the Dead Sea. And Lord, we will cross this river on Tuesday, rejoicing in you with brightness and light and shining in love. And you know that we have the victory because you are the victor. It is your power, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. Thank you, Father, for bringing us victory in Jesus' name. Amen. Cliff. Okay, Cliff and then Connie. <clears throat> Lord, we just ask that you push back the powers of darkness around so many people in this nation, Lord. Lord, we ask that you give those people who are against you, Lord, that you give them an experience, a, a road of Damas Damascus road experience, Lord. Lord, we ask that you bring those people who are against you into your family that way, Lord. Lord, we ask for an outcome here that the United States is still a country that will honor Israel, that will honor you. Lord, we ask for that outcome in our nation and in our election. Amen. Connie. Thank you. Um, yes, Lord, we do. We ask for many Damascus Road experiences, um, that you just drop the scales off of our eyes, Lord, as we come to you, as we, uh, even as people come to vote, Lord, that, that you would give them the light in, in whatever way um, that is available. Lord, let us be available to be ones who shine the light and who answer your call. Thank you, Lord, for all you're doing. Thank you that you love us so much. Thank you that you love our country. Amen. 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 We're going to close with praying. I want to pray for all the people that have loved ones, and you know they're... they're oh, okay. One last one, Heather, but last but not least. Oh, Father God, just as our faith works like a currency in your kingdom, may our repentance work the same. May we as your children, believers of your word and actors of your word, may our repentance bring you so much joy that it covers those that don't know yet how to. But Father, I ask that you bless them unto repentance as well. In Yeshua's holy name, the name that is above all names. Amen. 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 Jennifer, do you want to close? <coughs> Lord, we thank you that you do sit in the heavens and laugh at what the enemy is doing. And Lord, we thank you that you are in control, but Lord, you use us. We're vital. Our prayers are vital. Lord, that we are your instruments. So we thank you now. We thank you now for using us in this time and after the election to accomplish your will. We thank you. We rejoice in you. We do raise a hallelujah to you. And we thank you, God. We thank you, God, that you are God and that you are Lord over all of this. And we pledge ourselves now this day to do our part in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> and if there's any copies left, the simple prayer with music is available in the back. Also, well, but she's not here. Who is going to take the picture? She's on her way. She got, she got stuck at the railroad tracks. She got stuck on the railroad tracks. Oh, okay. Well. Okay. She didn't get run over. No, okay. Uh, do you want to take the picture? I don't know what they were We're supposed to take a picture. Uh, well, you know what? We can... Tim will talk. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark 
of Full Stature Ministries at forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit forgive123.com.